present to the committee and uh, go to you present, Dr. Laura Hanson. Uh, she is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine, School of Medicine at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, I am a geriatrician and a palliative medicine physician. I want to start out by um, setting the stage. I think that's really my job, setting the stage in talking about the importance of pain and suffering and attention to pain and suffering as part of our healthcare delivery system. Many of you may realize that pain is really an area of clinical practice that has traditionally been neglected in the training of physicians and nurses and has been neglected, therefore, in the practice of medicine. What you may not realize quite as comprehensively is that pain is only one physical symptom. And pain really doesn't capture if we talk about it in isolation, the experience of patients and families with serious illness and the magnitude of suffering and the complexity of suffering that those individuals experience. We know from studies that have been done all across our healthcare system that wherever we look, there is untreated pain and suffering. Look in nursing homes, look in hospitals, look in intensive care units, look in home health, and you will find rates of pain, which is the symptom we track most aggressively, of between 40 and 70% of individuals. Rates of severe pain are around 10 to 15% of individuals found in those systems. We actually know that when we do look for other kinds of symptoms, other sources of physical distress, we find that shortness of breath, nausea, and fatigue are often more common symptoms than pain. We know that pain is undertreated. We don't actually know that so effectively about all those other symptoms, although I can tell you anecdotally from practice that those other symptoms are also undertreated. There's some inequality in the way that symptoms are undertreated. We know that for African Americans, for Latinos and for people with cognitive difficulties and people who are frail and elderly, those symptoms are more likely to be neglected and undertreated than for other populations. So this is also an area where we at least know something about some difficulty with health disparities. I don't know if any of you in this room have had experience personally with acute pain or with chronic pain or with other kinds of undertreated or untreated symptoms, but I can tell you from my clinical experience that people who do end up with functional limitations, the symptoms themselves get in the way of functioning, they end up with social disruption, they end up with depression, anxiety, and other um, complications of that problem. We face in our system a variety of barriers to treatment of symptoms. One is the barrier of education and training, which I mentioned before. Another is a barrier of expectations that people who are ill expect to suffer. They expect to be in pain. And those are expectations that we need to reach out, educate, and change. Some of the reasons that those symptoms are untreated are sometimes good. We value strength and stoicism as a society, and so people who use strength and stoicism sometimes don't complain. And that can be a strength, but it can also be a barrier. Um, finally, there may be barriers to communication about symptoms, barriers that are embedded in language difficulties, in cultural gaps, or barriers in terms of education and understanding about opportunities for treatment. I want to also describe that there are a couple of different kinds of symptoms and that the patterns of treatment and our principles for treatment turn out to be relatively different. And I encourage the committee in their deliberations to think about these differences. 
We work sometimes with individuals who have acute severe pain, say around an operation. And that pain is expected to rise at the time of the operation and then gradually improve. That pain has one kind of physiology and one kind of approach to treatment. But individuals can develop chronic unremitting pain, pain that will not go away because the underlying condition itself will not go away. With that population, we have different kinds of medication approaches and that population also needs self-management skills, education, guards against addiction or habituation to certain classes of medication, and a strong support system in order to help them manage their chronic pain over time. When we're working to treat patients' pain and other symptoms of source of suffering, it's important to point out that our objective is not necessarily complete elimination of the symptom. Our objective is really to make that individual's quality of life better. And that may mean balancing, at times, their objectives to remain awake and alert, to avoid certain medication side effects, against the objective of controlling pain, controlling shortness of breath, controlling nausea, or other kinds of symptoms. That balancing act can be a pretty tricky one clinically. Um, I, it's something that I do in my work all the time. It's something I'm specially trained to do. But I can tell you that I'm faced with challenges in that balancing act every day. And the medications that we use to manage difficult and complex symptoms are among some of the most challenging medications that we learn to use in medical practice. When we see an individual who is in the midst of this balancing act, I'm here to tell you as well that there's good news. That we are, as a nation, more effectively working to make inroads in this deficit in pain and symptom management. I want to say a few words about cannabinoids and about their place in the armamentarium of medications that are available to us to use. Typically in managing symptoms, we use medications that are gentle pain relievers, anti-inflammatories, or opioids, things that are in the morphine-related group. Cannabinoids are an emerging group, but actually have been in common use since the 1800s. There's a single medical preparation of a cannabinoid available in the United States for use called Marinol. It's available only in a tablet form, which means that the individual needs to be able to swallow in order to use it. It is approved for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, which I can tell you is a horrible problem, and it can be very helpful in that context. And it's also endorsed for the anorexia or weight loss and appetite loss syndrome in HIV disease, also a terrible problem. The limited evidence that we have for their use shows that there is promise in the area of treatment of spasticity and multiple sclerosis. There is promise in the area of treatment of nausea and vomiting, specifically nausea and vomiting in relationship to chemotherapy. And there may be some hints of promise in pain management, although cannabis doesn't necessarily exceed the pain management options that we currently have available to us. This is an area of promise, but an area where because of very limited research, it's hard for healthcare providers, patients, and families to understand the full import of this group of potential medications. I'll stop my comments there, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. I want to thank Dr. Hansen for taking the time out of her to that provide us some very valuable uh, information for you to consider, for the next steps to consider, and the general public to consider. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.